Hey, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity of presenting here. Uh, my name is Jon. I recently became a dad. And uh, about three months ago, I also joined SaySpring. Uh, all I can tell you... <laughs> <laughs> All I can tell you is that the last three months have been a hell of a journey. But we have been developing a new tool that will hopefully help all of our customers and maybe other service providers who deploy OpenStack and um, OpenShift in order to uh, automate things like project, user, network, and other type of resource provisioning. Uh, and we have developed this tool using mainly two technologies, which are NASA-Tio and Yuma, which is an HTTP framework uh, in Golang that provides um, uh, <coughs> open API as first-class citizen. This is a bit of the agenda. First, I will start talking a bit about SageSpring's mission, and then I will go a little bit more into the technical details about uh, what are the goals of the self-service API, a bit about the Yuma framework, uh, how we have developed uh, NAS microservices by using one of the new uh, NAS libraries, which is called NAS Micro. And in general, I will also try to explain what type of messaging patterns we have implemented uh, in this tool. Right, so this this project comes out from the need of being able to, as I said, provision resources like projects, users, networks, access control lists for our customers. And we have a lot of data centers. They are distributed mostly across the Nordics. So we have data centers in places like um, Verian, uh, Oslo, Stockholm, Calix, and Luleå. And this translates into, an, into a couple of different OpenStack installations, and this is quite likely to start growing up. In SageSpring, we always strive for the best security levels, and our cloud uh, offering is uh, complying with all the GDPR and European rules for security. And in all the tools that we are developing, uh, we try to use open standards, and so is the case for the tool that we are presenting here. Right, this is our vision. We would like to become the platform of choice for European cloud computing. Right, yes, I think there was enough talk about mission and my company. Let's get into the technical details. <laughs> so these are the overarching goals of the project. Um, as I said, we want to be able to have distributed management of customers. This will help us, of course, reduce the cost of operations a lot. Uh, and not only that, but also um, whenever our own customers start thinking, oh, I need more projects, then they can just simply use uh, an API and get more projects on, dem on demand. Uh, second goal is uh, infrastructure federation. Uh, this is something that has come to the table very recently because we have currently been involved in a project with the European Commission and we need to provide federated infrastructure across two different uh, companies. So we needed a way to be able to scale this whole OpenStack and OKD setup in t in within two different organizations. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, we also want to control what our customers can request from our infrastructure. So we have added a layer of control so that we can say, for example, that customer A is only able to request, for example, um, <coughs> a quota of two virtual CPUs or things like that. And we have also implemented the concept of self-service API users in order to manage all of these uh, control resources. Now, Humor is the HTTP framework that we have chosen for building the, the let's say, first interface for, for this tool. And this is needed because uh, one of the, our collaborators within this European Commission project is building a user interface. So we needed to rely on a 
standard that is well known and adopted within industry. And we decided on relying on a simple HTTP framework for that. But this, fr this framework is just, it's not just another framework. And the reason is that it does a couple of things very well. Um, it's very well integrated in the Golang ecosystem. Uh, in fact, it's integrating, uh, <coughs> it, it implements uh, common interfaces from the standard library, such as HTTP handler, uh, co standard context, and reader and writer interfaces in, in order to do uh, streaming. And most importantly, it's compatible with the most popular routers out there. Um, <coughs> in order to define your HTTP function handlers, it's also, um, <coughs> it's also using something called generic HTTP handler signatures, which, which means that all handlers will have the same shape. So you don't need to, you don't have very heterogeneous uh, function handlers, which is very nice in terms of maintainability. And on top of that, uh, <coughs> it uses annotated uh, colon types uh, for the input and outputs of the function handlers, which is very nice because it helps a lot with validation. Uh, and also, uh, it automatically is able to generate open API specification based on this, based on this typed uh, stacks. Now, this is an example of how we can define inputs and output models for uh, uh, a Yuma, a Yuma uh, function handler. Uh, we can use something called uh, struct annotations to, wait. Okay, you don't really see much, unfortunately. It's very, but the point is that those things that are on the right side of the attribute definitions are uh, struct annotations. And there you can define things like, for example, if an attribute in, in, the, JS, in the HTTP payload is um, obligatory or required or not. You can also do things like, I want this, this specific attribute, for example, services there, to be the uh, attribute that is used to pass on a query in HTTP. And you can also do things like automatic validation for emails. And you can, on top of that, uh, add uh, extra resolvers, which are custom validators. And all function handlers that you define within a uh, Huma follow the same function signature, which is a, a, f um, a function signature that has been able to be implemented like this because of the recent addition of Golang generics. And this is, again, something that helps a lot with the maintainability because all functions will pretty much look the same. They follow the same interface. And if you use this framework and you use this concept of generic function uh, handlers and you define your models, then what you get after defining your handlers is JSON schemas and open API specifications out of the box, created automatically for you, which is really nice because we want to communicate uh, as soon as possible with our customers that we have changed the API or for example, when we are drafting. This is as opposed to other ways of building API, this is a, how I would call it as a code first API design instead of designing the API first and then generating the code. Now, this is the HTTP uh, framework. However, we want to scale this into many different data centers. And HTTP is, I mean, you could do that, but it would be quite messy. It's not really able to do dynamic discovery of services. Uh, so you, you, you don't have a concept like you do in, um, message or into middleware of subjects that basically if you select the subject, all services will reply. So we need to, that's one of the limitations that we have with HTTP. HTTP also uses uh, only, you can only use request reply semantics. 
and HTTP calls generally act on a single backend and unless you start introducing concepts like API gateways and things can get pretty messy, I think. So in order to overcome this limitation of HTTP, we started thinking about using message middleware like NATS. NATS is extremely fast and it uses something called fire and forget message publishing. Um, in order to address services, unlike in, uh, unlike in HTTP, you use something called subject and uh, it, it has a feature about wildcard so that you can target multiple services at the same time in order to capture messages. Um, and it accepts any type of payload. So you, you can put HTTP or whatever other uh, encoding format you like. And these are some of the uh, patterns that you can implement using NATS. Uh, request and reply, basically in HTTP, publish and subscribe, fun in and fun out, scatter and gather, and load balancing, which is something that usually you want you do by implement uh, by, by bringing another service in order to do load balancing. But NATS provides it for you for free. So if you do not if you use NATS, you get load balancing for free. Uh, I will go back to these patterns later. And within that, what we have been looking into is uh, a package that is called NAS Micro. And what you can do with this is basically defining services uh, that are discoverable, observable, and nomadic. And by nomadic, I mean that they can be moved anywhere you want, and they can uh, still perform in the same way. Because they don't it's not like with HTTP, they talked about subjects. So you can move them across different NAT clusters and they will still operate in the same way. Um, wh why why NAT Micro? Because it also is very, it makes it very simple to do load balancing. And it, by using this command that you see down here, uh, you can very easily do monitoring of your services and you can observe if there is errors happening and things like that. Now, uh, in order to implement um, NAT microservices, you basically use a function, a function that looks like that one in the right column, a uh, handler function. And uh, on top of that, you need to define uh, NAT micro lets you use some primitives which are called services, groups, and endpoints. And with that, you can basically build the architecture of your services. Uh, yes, this is, this is something that is unfortunately fairly, fairly difficult to, to explain without, um, without the demo, but I truly encourage you to try it out. Um, but basically, uh, the idea is that an endpoint uh, in NAS Micro translates sort of to a HTTP endpoint. And then you have different ways of grouping these NAS uh, endpoints, which, is, uh, which goes down to groups and services. So that's more or less the idea. Now, this is the, like, general view of the architecture of the tools that we have built. So first we have as a, the outmost interface of the system, the cell service HTTP API. And then we have the NATS microservices, which are in this case, OKD operator service. Don't get me wrong. I use the word operator and, and controller here, but I'm not talking about Kubernetes. I'm talking about NATS microservices. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, basically the idea is that we can deploy these NAS microservices on many different uh, sites. And then as soon as we get an HTTP request in, in the cell service API, we distribute these messages to all different data centers so that these resources we want like projects and so on are created. Uh, and that includes uh, OKD namespaces, for example, or open site projects. So basically, this is another way of <laughs> trying to explain what I just described. So we have um, the cell service API doing 
pub publish here. Uh, not sure if it, no, it totally and unfortunately. But um, we have the self-service API doing publish against NATs, for example, on an endpoint like self-service project create. On and these NAS microservices are listening on this subject. So both of these microservices, after configuring something called the Q group, uh, will get this message and in turn contact the OpenStack and OK the APIs in order to create the resources. This is. Um, uh, one of the patterns that we have implemented using NAT is called the fun in and fun out pattern. So what happens is that uh, our client, which is the HTTP uh, API, does an asynchronous publish to all NAT microservices. And basically, fun in it would be the message that the client is sending and fun out would be the distribution of these services. And within NATS, what happens is that we have two different queue groups, one for OKD uh, uh, services and one for OpenStack services, uh, operators, sorry. And the idea with the queue groups is then that if we deploy more than one replica of these operators, it, they will automatically be load balanced. So we can achieve higher availability. Um, and this is basically what I just described, but a bit more in detail with the overarching architecture of the system. And this is a pattern that we have used within two of the operations that we, had, that we have defined in the HTTP API, which are create project and create user. I think I'm actually missing a couple of slides. I'm not sorry, maybe I actually just went over the, the things too quickly. Okay. Seems like something might have been gone. But anyway. Uh, oh no, it's here. Okay. <laughs> right. So the other pattern that we have implemented is uh, the scatter garden pattern. And this applies to um, some of the operations that are um, using the pattern of request and reply, uh, which are, for example, listing all users across all different services from OKD and from uh, OpenStack. Uh, so what happens is that the client, the HTTP API, sends uh, an ads uh, request and then all different operators in both the OpenStack and OKD queue groups will reply with their own messages. And then the client is in turn waiting for all these messages and aggregating them. And this is again the more, the more detailed view of the architecture. Uh, you see that there is at the central services box, we have a cute uh, quota and ACL controller. This is something that <coughs> you, you see at the moment, it doesn't have any arrow connected to it. But uh, the idea is that, for example, when you create uh, a project that uh, <coughs> this, this quota and ACL controller will also be contacted by the HTTP API in order to make sure that the users, for example, have uh, have quota to request the resources they want. Now, I, in my view, we have faced two major challenges when developing this tool. One of them is having a single API for both a, uh, OKD and OpenStack. These are two, two completely different, in a way, tools that have their own APIs and we have had to come up with an abstraction that kind of works for our use case and still manages to do the same thing. Um, <clears throat> in particular, uh, things like users and groups have been probably the most challenging part. And uh, we have also implemented things like uh, user access and um, 
whether whether a user has access to projects like user claims using in OKD using uh, Kubernetes annotations, which in, in in the beginning we thought it was going to be difficult because uh, it's, it's, you're not meant to be storing a, a um, the type of data in annotation because it's not a database. But since we are managing with small set amount of users, then it's quite okay. Um, and then the second big challenge was uh, integration testing. Um, we wanted to be able to test all the microservices that we are building against the recyclable OpenStack and OKD environments. Uh, we looked into the project of MicroStack and CRC. Um, Microsoft, I need to say, I'm, we managed to get it to work with uh, fairly little effort, but only with OpenStack Usuri, which is a couple of years old, unfortunately. Uh, and CRC, uh, we did get it to work, but it was just not possible in the first place to get it to work with nested virtualization. Um, yeah. And then, in general, when you have a lot of microservices and then on top of them uh, an HTTP API, one thing that was a bit tricky was the timeouts and being able to propagate errors from the microservices all the way to the outermost layer. Uh, but in the end, I think it kind of worked out. Uh, that was all. <laughs>